from live. <clears throat> Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I am Roger Killen, the organizer. This talk is brought to you by Ion Connect. This state-of-the-art co-working space and tech lab helps grow innovative ideas to commercialization and market launch. Our speaker this evening is Dennis Wilson. Dennis M. Wilson, to be precise. Dennis is the number one global small business sales expert. He has written three books, started several multi-million dollar companies, and is driven by the relentless pursuit to help people grow and succeed. He has also launched, uh, helped launch and mentor over 700 companies in 30 different countries, in multiple languages, and with a total turnover of over $1.4 billion in revenue. Mm -hmm. Vancouver Business Network members and most welcome guests, I invite you now to put your hands together and give Dennis M. Wilson the welcome that he deserves. Here we go. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight. I understand how completely terrible the traffic was. We came from Vancouver and Waze had us literally drive all the way up Burnaby Mountain and then down through all the back roads to get here. So I assume that meant if you went on any major road, you were in a whole bunch of trouble. So tonight I would like to share with you some information about uh, the secrets to successful joint ventures. Uh, probably the most misunderstood word at this point. Uh, we're also gonna cover partnerships, uh, probably the easiest thing to go wrong is business partnerships. And um, again, uh, so I'm Dennis Wilson. I don't really need to say much of this. Uh, except that I do believe very strongly that all small businesses can actually increase their sales fairly dramatically with little or no money. You just need some techniques and some elbow grease and a bit of effort. We're going to cover some of those ways tonight. Uh, I am the founder of Small Business Dream and the Small Business Sales Blueprint, which is five steps to increase your sales while minimizing your stress. I have written a book called The Small Business Profitability Secrets, and I've written two others as well. And as Roger said, I've actually helped a lot of companies uh, over the last 25 years uh, grow. Uh, my largest client was over a billion dollars a year in turnover. And um, we just really enjoy helping small businesses and entrepreneurs trying to get off the ground. So I live in Yale Town. Um, it's a really, really nice place. I live on the 20th floor. I have a great view. I even have a bowling alley in my basement. I have lived there for two and a half years. I have bowled zero times. But it's there. It's like the capacity. So I do work from home and I actually run all of my businesses through my home and my first business is actually an MLM software business. I actually, believe it or not, have a couple of clients in the room and previous clients in the room. Um, I actually grew this to one of the top five in the world for MLM software. Uh, it afforded me the ability to travel to 19 countries. Clients would always get in a panic and fly me into uh, wonderful places to help with their panic. So when someone said, yeah, can you come to Seattle? It's like, and it be Thailand or something more fun. Um, the other company that I run from my, from my home, and this I call Business 3, is actually Cryptmint. This is a cryptocurrency mining company. We put about $2 million into infrastructure and mining machines. We currently, uh, we currently uh, mine between three and four Bitcoin a month. Um, I call it Business Number 3 because Business Number 2 is actually Small Business Dream, which is what we're here to share a little bit of information with you about tonight. And I get asked a lot, what's the key to success? What's the key to success? How do you make business happen? What makes it work? And the reality is the number one key I've found is really, really, really great staff and really, really, really great partners. So this is actually a picture of my staff from Australia. So this is my Australian contingent out for dinner. Um, I think we probably drank a little bit too much that night, but that tends to happen in Australia. And this is one of my business partners. Sorry, sorry, Craig. <laughs> so Craig is in the room. Craig at one time was actually Ronald McDonald, uh, the best uh, young person's gig you can get, in my opinion. Um, I tend to leave Vancouver when it gets cold and rainy. So this is my cold and rainy picture, which is actually my daughter. Um, and I go to Japan on my way to Australia. 
So that'd be with a very good friend of mine in front of Mount Fuji. And this picture of Australia is actually from my hotel window, out look, looking over Surfer's Paradise. Now, it hasn't always been this way. Um, you know, things were different. Raise your hand if you have ever bought milk this way. <laughs> awesome. So we grew up really poor. So every Thursday, milk delivery came and we got four of these bags of milk. So that's about four liters of milk. One was for dad, the other three for my brother and my mom and I. And the rule was really simple. You could drink as much milk as you wanted. Problem was when it was gone, there was no more till Thursday. So um, we didn't get to go on school ski trips. We just didn't have the money. Um, our holidays were camping in a tent trailer. And I can remember many a times looking across the highway at the really nice motel with the swimming pool and going, oh, I wonder when we can do that. And I didn't even know there was such a thing as a hotel because I wouldn't have been looking at the motel if I knew that. Um, and when I was about nine years old, I got given a rock polo shirt for Christmas. This was the best part of my camping trips. I had collected all these rocks from streams and whatever. You throw them in this machine, they come out really shiny. You stick some googly eyes on them, you go door to door and you sell them for a dollar each. Uh, this was my first business. <laughs> now, the chemicals are not chemicals, the compounds that are polishing, they only come in really big jugs and they're pretty expensive. I had run out. Um, my mom noticed that I was in a bit of a quandary because I had enjoyed a life of candy and movies with my profits. So she offered to help me by procuring these compounds and then taking 50% of future sales until I paid them back. I like to call this my first informal partnership. And then I learned a really important lesson. See, I was only allowed to walk so far away from my house, that was the rule. And uh, I very quickly hit market saturation. <laughs> I'd knock on the door and people just wouldn't answer. <laughs> what are you selling now? Um, my second surprise partnership actually had to do with this funny device. So. We didn't have cable TV. Uh, as a result, I would go to school and people would talk about Scooby-Doo and all of this stuff that has to do with, you know, cable TV. And so I felt a little bit left out. So I went to my dad and I said, Dad, I think we should have cable TV. He says, we'll have cable TV just as soon as you pay for it. I'm like, all right, how much? He goes, it's $11 a month. So I ran up to my room <laughs> and I pulled down my Lonnie Anderson poster. You see, because my brother used to steal my money, so I'd tape it all onto the back of my posters. He couldn't find it. And I took my $11 down to my father and I said, okay, let's get cable TV. He said, no, no, no. How do I know you're gonna pay next month and the next month? I'm like, unless you give me a year in advance, I'm not doing it. So I went up and I took down Brooke Shields and I took down her faucet and I took down <laughs> Derek. And sadly, I even had to take down Valerie Burton. I went down with my $121 and I said, dad, it's time to get cable TV. And he agreed. And then one night we were sitting, and of course it was a show I wanted to watch, and I'm paying for cable TV, yeah. And there was a show he wanted to watch. So I said, Dad, I think I should get to watch my show because I'm paying for the cable TV. And he says, I agree, as long as you're willing to watch it from outside in the tent you're going to live in because I pay for the house. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a great partnership tip here, and that was that compromise is key. From then on, we watched what he wanted. Uh, my next business was a really, really cool joint venture, I like to say. So my dad came home with this watermelon. Like, it was this big. Because, like, when you're nine, like, it's that big. And he was like, we don't have anything to do with awesome watermelon, whatever you know. So I'm going to go sell it. He says, okay, you give it a go. So I went out and set up a table, and I sold all that watermelon. Somehow word got around in our little town of 14,000 people, and the people just kept coming. So I enlisted all my friends to run home and get sugar and Kool-Aid mix and iced tea and baked goods and anything they could find. Get it here, we had to sell it. And the reason I did that is I had already learned long ago with the polishing compounds that if I go to mom, she's gonna take a cut. My friends at the end of it all finally said, hey, look, um, what are we doing here? We did all this, so I actually divvied up a little bit of the money and I realized that I was in a joint venture because of course a joint venture is a commercial, commercial enterprise that is undertaken jointly by two or more parties, which otherwise retain their distinct identities. It was a perfect, perfect joint venture in my opinion. We actually made a lot of money. So then I moved on to being a paper boy. Um, so raise your hand if you have kids that have been a paper boy or a paper girl, or you've been a paper girl, raise your hands. 
Yes. Now, keep your hands up if you've had to deliver your children's papers. <laughs> okay. Never happened with me. Um, I actually was pretty good at selling right from an early age, and there was a contest that if I got people to sign up for the Edmonton Journal, yes, it was cold outside in the winter, uh, for, for eight weeks and prepay for that, that I could get a trip to Disneyland when I sold 77 people. Mm -hmm. So believe it or not, the last guy, the last guy I talk to, he tells me how much he loves the newspaper. And I'm like, I'm going to Disneyland. And then he says, but I'm allergic to the ink, so I can't. I can't do it. And I said, sir, you know, I said, you're the last guy, and then I get to go to Disneyland. So if I bought you a pair of rubber gloves, <laughs> would you take the paper for eight weeks? You can cancel the day after eight weeks. And he says, you know, he says, um, I'll buy my own rubber gloves. Thank you. And he didn't cancel. And I went to Disneyland. My next job was... <laughs> Uh, my next job was this place. Um, the great Gunnels. place. <laughs> uh, it is. Um, it's a great place. You learn lots of cool stuff. It was my very first experience with being an employee. I didn't like it very much. Like, apparently, I'm not so good with authority. Go figure. Um, it was also my first experience with office politics. Um, within my companies, I tell everybody the day that I hire them, if anything gets political and you bring it to my attention, I'm firing you. I just don't like politics. I learned to not like them here. Then I moved on to a lumberyard job. This was a very interesting job. I learned a lot of very, very key things. Um, I drove truck and I drove the lumber trucks that you drop the lumber off. And one day I was asked to drop lumber into a guy's garage. Now this was plywood, very slippery stuff. It's actually OSP board. And he'd seen me drive before, and he says, no, nah, no, nah, you can do it. It's no big deal. I'm like, no, nah, but you, you got a polished concrete floor. It's slippery. Like, this is a bad idea. Like, I can't guarantee you that it's not going to bash up your house. Now, I've seen you do it before. You can do it. So, of course, I pulled out the waiver. I worked with him as a truck driver, and I asked him to sign it. He happily signed it. And uh, I didn't even get the luck of this tilt deck. We just put rollers on, and we got into reverse, and we shot it off the back end of a, of a five-ton truck. I did land the load perfectly. I landed it like two inches into his polished, slippery concrete floor. And raise your hand if you played air hockey. <laughs> this load of lumber took off like an air hockey puck right through the back of his garage, like picture square hole. <laughs> I looked at him, he looked at me. I was sure there was a call going to that office. Signed the waiver. So I learned in that moment, risk assessment, waivers, and crisis. <laughs> um, I actually did my pilot's license. So part of the working in the lumber yard was to take a year off to get my pilot's license because I'm a green to be a commercial pilot. As a result of that, you have to do a medical exam, and they found a murmur. A murmur is relatively harmless. My murmur happened to be uh, something about air and valve regurgitation. So I was born with a bicuspid valve, which means two flaps instead of three, like the Mercedes Benz. Uh, blood doesn't come out perfectly smooth, and some of it leaks back in, blah, 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 blah. And it turns out that it's very hard to maintain a commercial license with this condition. So I had to go to plan B. Now, plan B was my father's plan, and that was that he always wanted to be a mechanical engineer. So I went to BCIT, and I went to school to become a mechanical engineer. Well, going to uh, BCIT, I then decided to go get my Bachelor of Commerce at UBC because I wanted to be a business person. And I did that by selling neon open signs door to door. So I started with neon open signs door to door. And this actually morphed into a joint venture. The guy who had the inventory and the facility started wanting me to do more with them. And I just sort of agreed. I didn't really know what was going on. I figured, well, hang on, if I'm making 100 and a quarter a sign, and now I'm in a joint venture, I'm going to make more. I was making less, working harder, and I was confused. Uh, so the lesson I learned with that situation was it's probably best to get things in writing, even if it's simple writing. <laughs> uh, raise your hand if you ever wished after the fact you had it in writing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I agree. Um, there was a bit of an interesting twist to this story in that he eventually was hard up for cash, and he says, look, and I, I need you to buy it out and take over the ramp, and I, I need out. So he said, uh, you know, what's a fair price? And I think there was... 
$60,000 of inventory. So I said 30,000 bucks. And I said, but I can't pay it all at once. I can give you it over three years. And he said, no, I tried. And then three or four months later, he came back and he needed money now. He says, look, all up front, how much could you pay? So I went, $6,000? He said, yes, and now I was in business. And then I took on a partner and we went from just importing and reselling open signs to a full-blown neon sign factory. So we were one of the first in Canada to mass produce neon signs. This company I did with a proper shareholders agreement, right? Everything perfect, fantastic. Um, I grew it to $1 million in sales and 14 staff. How many people think at 27 years old that it's pretty cool that you could grow a company this size? I thought it was cool, right? Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> what I didn't realize is I was basically borrowing my salary from the bank. I figured out at the end that I was $200,000 in debt. My partner and I did actually uh, go our separate ways. We never looked at the shareholders agreement at all. We came to a gentleman's agreement that we thought was fair. We could have gone back to it, but again, sort of it was nice to know that it was there. And I walked away with all of the debt. And then I had somebody take the company over, leaving me with the debt but keeping the assets. Anyways, it didn't work out so good. It, wasn't, it was not the best, uh, best experience. So now I had no company, no cash flow, no job. It was dark. It was really, really dark. And then I found this industry called multi-level marketing, or maybe multi-level marketing town me, I'm not sure. I think it was Bob's fault, actually. He was, my very, he was the owner of my very first multi-level marketing company. Um, now this, some people say, is the ultimate joint venture because you take your list, you add to it your effort. You then go find a company who can provide products and or services, and you put that all together and you make a fistful of money, right? We've heard this, right? Um, so what's the difference between MLM and a joint venture? Well, MLM tends to pay a little bit less for every sale when you make the sale. Joint ventures tend to pay a little bit more. MLMs pay in depth, joint ventures don't, but they pay a little bit more. So they're similar, but they are quite different. Um, by being involved in this MLM industry, I eventually got my rent to be paid on time. I managed to dig out of debt. I spent 10 years, what I call failing forward. Um, I then managed to top up my income at $22,800 a week. And I did that for a consistent <laughs> period of time. So that works out to about a million to a year. And then the company closed. Um, yeah. That was sort of how it looked. Um, so what's interesting about MLM is in MLM, you're always taught don't work too. And I agree with this. So what we're going to talk to you about tonight is actually joint ventures. And I actually recommend that in joint ventures, you really shouldn't only do one. You, I heard someone say it earlier. We had a one joint venture and it wasn't very good. And unfortunately, that ended up creating a problem. So joint ventures are often better done with more than one. So write this down. Don't rely on a single joint venture once I teach you how to do them successfully. So I then started an MLM, my, my MLM software company. Um, this was my second official partnership, and this was just a little napkin agreement. Um, I had $800,000 in the bank from the previous company. I, for anyone who's owned a software company, um, actually raise your hand if you've owned a software company. Um, they're hungry, huh? They need a lot of cash. So I managed to burn through my entire savings and then rack up all of my debt before we finally turned the corner and turned cash flow positive. Once we turned cash flow positive, that was about year six. We finally started taking a salary in year six. Uh, then things started to go. It was really quite exciting. It's continuing to go to this day. I have some amazing staff that look after it. They give me the opportunity to do lots of cool stuff. And then we branched out into the small business dream market. Um, this is targeted to small business dreams. We figured we could have more impact by going to help small business owners versus just the MLM companies. We built a sales and marketing automation tool, and now we've actually wrapped it up to do some really, really interesting things. We've worked with companies like End of the Roll, Direct Buy, Doctors, Carnival, Holiday Inn, um, and it just continues to go on. I also published a book called The Small Business Profitability Secrets. It's available on Amazon. So life's been pretty good up till here. Um, this is, you know, traveling around in, in Europe and in Cyprus and in Shanghai and New York with Craig. It's, it's been fun. It's been really good. But then the end of 2013 happened. 
So my wife had been goading me because I was now over 40 and she's like, you need to get uh, a proper physical done. So I'm a hospital phobe, like serious hospital phobe. Not I don't like them, but actually really, I can tell you stories for hours, but really bad. Um, so my good friend found this place called Copeland Healthcare where it's much more like an office environment. So I decided to go and I got fully checked out and I was perfect. I just needed to wait a few months for the echocardiogram because after finding that aortic, uh, aortic regurgitation. Um, I was supposed to get one every two years. I had been 22, that's close enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a guy, I'm a hospital phone. <laughs> so I was cleared that I'm perfectly healthy, no big deal. Go away on your next trip. So off I go to Japan and I'm in Sapporo shoveling snow because that's what you do in Sapporo in the wintertime because it snows a lot. And after I was done shoveling snow, I really didn't feel well. Um, this is one of the favorite things on the planet for me to eat. Uh, it was not appetizing. I wasn't hungry. Uh, for those that know me, I talk a lot and I wasn't talking. So my whole family was really concerned about me. So I just thought, oh, I'm just tired or whatever, stressed out or getting old, something like that. So I went up to my room, watched Netflix, fell asleep, woke up, felt fine, and got on the plane to be home in time for my echocardiogram. Excellent. So I go from echocardiogram and it's all, you know, just you go in, they do their thing. And it was kind of an office environment. It was good. And, and um, it went on for about an hour and a half. Usually it takes 15 minutes. And then they said, you just go out and, you know, sit on the couches over there. So I did. And the doctor came in and he said, Mr. Wilson, you need open heart surgery ASAP. I think maybe he first said, hi, my name's something. But like it was all a blur. So of course, first thing is, no, no, hospital foam not happening and then it was sort of freaked out tears uh panicked wife and all these wonderful things so it turns out that i have or had what's called an aortic aneurysm this is called the widowmaker you bump into a pole your heart explodes you die uh, so that's not ideal at 35 millimeters is a normal person's aortic valve uh, diameter thank you um 50 millimeters you're you're emergent for open heart surgery that's like both now. Uh, I was 59 millimeters, so they treated me like a China doll. Because of my hospital phobe, they actually got me a very private room in the CSICU in, um, in St. Paul's. And I, sorry, this gets hard for me. This was tough. Um, so here I spent my first night thinking that I was fine. My wife was there, it was good. My second night, um, I started to trip into a rather unlikely partnership. See, I started to get scared. I started to think, what about the friends I'm not going to meet? I started to think that they're going to like open me up and take my heart out of my chest and fix it and put it back. And I was worried about the scar. I didn't realize that, actually that's just really cool. Like it was like, total. But I was really scared. Um, and I didn't really understand that fear. But I actually realized at that moment that I was actually afraid to die. So then I heard the rolling door of my room open and a nurse, no, I think my angel came around the corner and I was in a full on panic attack. I'm freaking out, I'm sobbing, I'm snotty, it's disgusting. And she comes around and she says, Mr. Wilson, what's going on, you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. She says, Mr. Wilson. And then she proceeded to do something that was life altering for me. She took off her latex glove and she put her hand on my arm. And if you know any nurses, tell them that that is life altering for people because that rubber glove when you're in panic is not good. And she proceeded to say, Mr. Wilson, you are hooked up to sort of every monitor and medical device that is known to man in this hospital. So when the nurse comes by and asks you if something's wrong, we already know something's wrong. So what is it? And I'm like, no, nah, no, don't worry about me. It's fine. I'm just having a pity party. You go look after the people more important. I'm not even supposed to be in this room. You know, it's because of my, and she's like, Mr. Wilson, she says, you see that desk out there? She says, my job is to sit at that desk and look at you for my whole shift. I have nowhere else to be. This is one-to-one -one patient care. So what's up? So she just talked to me for probably a couple of hours before I fell asleep. I woke up, she was still there. She then sort of saw me through the rest of the adventure until, yay, out I come. 
this is me, doped up. <laughs> so it was really weird. I could go on forever about these stories, but the weirdest one was I popped out of surgery. I could not speak English. I was only speaking Japanese. Um, that was all very curious. Uh, but anyways, we worked out. We got past it. So I, I didn't have the epiphanies of, uh, oh my God, I wish I had more money. Oh my God, you know, my wife's not going to be financially okay. I had sort of done okay by now. Things were okay. Um, but what I did realize is I had a bit of regret on not making enough impact. In the multi-level marketing world, I thought I could make the impact through my clients, but I found a lot of the times the clients would sort of get in the way of making the impact with the actual end user that's trying to change their life. So I realized that I hadn't spent enough time on small business dream. So this was sort of my takeaway. I have a company that's doing well, but I just didn't feel like I was doing enough. And I really, really enjoyed helping small businesses. Like you help an MLM company make money, they're like, yeah, but you help a small business owner who runs a hair salon go from just barely paying bills to making an extra $600 a month in their pocket. And it's life changing. And I realized this was rewarding. So I got focused and um, I made concrete plans for small business dream. I put another million dollars into development of the app and the, the, the web tools. I created the sales blueprint. Um, I hit networking events really hard. Uh, I found great mentors. This was new to me, the idea of going to a mentor and letting someone else get into my business. How many people have used mentors? Raise your hand. Right? This was foreign to me. I love it now. I didn't then. And we developed the Small Business Sales Blueprint, which is a five-step system to maximize sales with less stress. And I was out there educating, entertaining, doing all of this stuff with small businesses, teaching joint ventures. Uh, that's actually in Barcelona, Spain, Japan. Uh, Craig and I in New York. Um, and this is where we now get into the partnership portion of the evening. So those were things I did. You've heard about some of my partnerships. You've heard about some of my joint ventures. So now let's get into partnerships, which is actually in our sales blueprint, step five, which we call intensive, intense by profits. And the first tip we usually give clients is you can often really, really increase your profitability in sales by forming strategic partnerships. As some in the room have already suggested, partnerships can sometimes be a little bit scary. They can often not work out. So as I went down this journey, I was with my very good friend in Japan eating fugu. Uh, it's okay, you don't die, right? Even heart surgery won't get you, don't worry. Um, and I was getting some great ancient Japanese advice. And I'm like, you know, what do you do to have better partnerships? And uh, he basically just said to me, he says, Go isho, kakinasai. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> there it happens again. Sorry, write it down, right? Wow, everything's happy. Make a simple agreement between you, right? Just write down the basics. It doesn't have to be legalese. In fact, when it gets to be legalese, you're usually going to end up button heads. Start with something simple. Obviously, if you're a true joint venture where it's Millions and millions going in, hire the lawyer. But if it's somebody that you're just going to partner with and, and, and build a business together, it may not be necessary. So one of the things that I always see in clients is there's often an uneven split between money and effort in partnerships. And this creates a bit of a divide right from day one. You know, one person putting in the money, the other person putting in the effort. And sometimes they think that that's equal. And I think the biggest key is you have to be careful. So you're going to need to write down who owns what percentage. 50-50 is often assumed in a two-person partnership, but it's not usually actually true. If one's putting in the money and it was their idea and the other's putting in the sweat equity, it doesn't necessarily mean it's 50-50. So if you're the guy with the money and the idea, you might want to push a little harder for being more than 50%. And if you're the person with just the sweat equity and, and you know, everything else, you might want to consider that maybe you're not worth 50%. Like be realistic when you go into a partnership. Don't assume that just because you breathe, you should be 50%. It's, it's not always true. So then you need to have a tie-breaking mechanism. So does anybody, have, raise your hand if you have an idea of a good tie-breaking mechanism if you're in a 50-50 partnership and um, you have a problem. Raise your hand if you have an idea. Roger. Flip of a coin. Roger says, flip of a coin. Um, sometimes it's as good as way as any. Anybody else? <laughs> Russian roulette. <laughs> That's kind of like a shotgun clause, isn't it? <laughs> but smaller. Okay. <laughs> James. Yeah, 
kind of like the shotgun. Talk about that in a second. Okay, so excellent. Thank you very much. All very, very valid ideas. And strangely enough, sometimes it's money. So that's good. Um, cash call. What happens when you run out of money? I know you never plan to, and that's why when you're fine, you decide what to do if it happens. Because once it happens, guess what? It gets really hard to decide what to do. So what if there's a cash call? What if somebody's salaried and now there's not enough money? What do you do? Who puts in the money? Does it dilute the other guy? What happens? You need to just think about what are you going to do if you run out of money? And it's hard because you're excited about your business venture. You're not going to run out of money, right? What about selling the company? Sometimes this is easy. If you're 50-50, you sell the company. As long as you both agree. What if one wants to sell and the other doesn't? What are you going to do? Are you going to go to an arbitrator? What's the mechanism? <laughs> Simple things. And then of course you want to know who's responsible for what. Salaries that are going to be paid, if any. Uh, when will a uh, raise occur, right? If you're not profitable and one of the people is working as a partner and getting a salary, do you give them a raise before profits? They might expect so because cost of living keeps going up. So you got to discuss it, right? What if you're not paid market value? It's very common that you have a lawyer in a partnership with a non-lawyer and when the lawyer's doing lawyerly work, he's worth $450 an hour. And then the other partner is doing non-lawyerly work that's worth $30 an hour. And the lawyer says, well, I did that work. I should get for $450. What do you do, right? One of the suggestions I always have is the lawyer gets paid the same as the worker, but the difference is accrued for when there's profit. So when there's profit, the lawyer gets his money. Simple ideas can really, really help to make sure that your partnership doesn't go crazy. So if a non-salary partner can, no, this was it. Non-salary partner contributes professional time or service, what rate do they get paid and when, right? Often the never, never plan's okay. The, the expensive person is gonna need their ego to stay in check by being acknowledged that they're worth their normal day rate. Doesn't mean they need to be paid it today, but they need to be acknowledged that it's there. So that's where the paying in the future can be done. And of course, once you get profitable, what do you do? You might have accrued payments to make you might just be splitting the money. And a lot of partners think, oh, we're just gonna split the profits 50-50. Well, you can't take all the profits out of a company typically and have the company continue to grow. So you're gonna to have to decide, are we gonna take 50% of the profits and split them? Or are we gonna take all of the profits or 20% of the profits? You're gonna to have to have just a little bit of a plan before you have profits. Because once you have profits, people start thinking new cars and they, it, 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 your heads tend to explode when you start to make money. It's a terrible thing. It's actually easier to run companies that don't make lots of money than ones that make lots of money. And of course, what do you do when a partner wants out? Um, written agreements, again, simple, just real, real simple ones. And to illustrate that, my partnership ending in Internet Next Step, we were successful partners for 15 years and finally he was at board, he wanted out. So we had that little napkin agreement and it was really quite funny because we sat down and negotiated a settlement. And we both got a little picky about a couple of points. And then we remembered that we had that napkin. We went and looked back at the napkin. And when we looked back at the napkin, I realized that the point I was being picky about, I had misremembered. But it was better than that because the point he was picky about, he had also misremembered. So as soon as we were able to go back and go, this is what we had agreed to 15 years ago, the problem went away and it was just as peaceful as anything. So it wasn't a legal document, it wasn't fighting, it was just, this is what we agreed to when we were still friends. Don't underestimate the power of a simple agreement in a partnership. Okay, I think most of you are here to talk about joint ventures, right? So some of you are gonna be a little bit disappointed because we're not gonna talk about completely traditional joint ventures tonight. So we're not gonna talk about company A and company B decided to partner up to make company C for mutual benefit. That's not the joint ventures we're going to talk about. We're going to sort of talk about the 2020 definition of joint ventures. So a 2020 joint venture usually works around this concept of a person with a list, partners up with a person with a product or service, and uh, sells it for them and collects a commission. So sometimes they're called affiliate programs. They're a little bit different, but same general concept. Um, so 2020 joint venture. Raise your hand if you have a good idea as to why you should do a 2020 joint venture. Anybody? Yes. One, uh, one uh, you basically get to take advantage of uh, somebody with your contacts and somebody with the product that your contacts could use. 
Exactly. So both of you benefit. That's right. So he, yeah. sorry, your name what? Yulia. Yulia. I don't know the name. Yes. <laughs> Yulia says that you get to take advantage of people who have contacts and people who have product. And this is completely true. So the, really what that boils down to is the fact that joint ventures done correctly increase sales and revenue base. Done incorrectly, they do little or nothing. In fact, they probably decrease your energy because you spend so much time doing it wrong that nothing ever happens. So five steps to doing a successful joint venture. Step one, determine your joint venture type. Step two, research. Step three, prepare. This is the big one. Step four, engage. And step five, follow up. Step six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven, same as five. <laughs> so, um, step one: determine your desired joint venture. So I've broken it down to the sort of three types of joint ventures. There's the zero to one. You have a huge list of prospects, nothing to sell. Um, that's pretty cool, right? One to zero: you have products or services, but little or no list. Or you have products or services and a big list. This sort of gives you the most amount of power. Um, I find that a lot of people think joint ventures are all about you get someone to sell your stuff. We've actually found sometimes the most powerful joint ventures are where you sell other people's stuff. And the reason why is when you sell your stuff, you have to provide your stuff. So whether that's consulting services, it takes your time. When you sell somebody else's stuff, you're actually just collecting money and you don't have any sort of hangover from it. So sometimes it's faster to increase the sales of your business by adopting a product that you can sell to the people you know that you don't have to support. So it generates you cash flow to focus more on what you do. So research phase. So let's say you're the one that has a huge list. Well, then you need to go research on Google for joint ventures or affiliate programs selling appropriate things. Now be very careful, this is tricky. Everyone thinks, oh, I just go join a bunch of affiliate programs. Affiliate programs are probably the they're the low hanging fruit as far as being able to just jump into an affiliate program. You just say yes and they say yes and everything goes. They're not usually the best because that product or service may not specifically fit with your audience. Um, a lot of times you're going to make less with those affiliate programs than you will with actually finding someone who really you can make the connection with and form a proper joint venture. So don't just jump on affiliate programs. Look at things that you can sell to the people you know or the list that you have that are appropriate. They don't compete with you but they're not completely different either. So you find 10, if you have a huge list, you're gonna go find your 10 joint venture partners. Again, they have to be complementary businesses, not competitive. And you can't go and sell, oh, I don't know, you don't wanna go and sell cars to people that only believe in bicycles. It's not gonna work. You have to make sure that what you're trying to sell to your list is stuff that they're already sort of familiar with. It needs to fit. Now you don't need to just find businesses, you can also find influencers. In this case, you're looking for an influencer that really has common ground with you. Um, use Google, so if you have products, so now we're moving on to the other one where you have products. So basically it's the same advice. You need Google to find a list, you need 10 joint venture partners, you need to be complementary businesses, and you need to be or, or, or influencers. So the research phase is actually fairly similar. There's just a bit more of it um, when you have a one-to-one. -one. When you have a one-to-one, -one, you have to research both sides. So, what would you think it would cost to pay someone to do this research? I'm lazy, so I always look for like Fiverr or you know, Upwork or somewhere to do the work for me. Um, and what we found when we broke it down was if it took you an hour per joint venture partner that you found, so you might have to look at 10 before you find one, and you're paying $50 an hour to someone who actually has enough English skills, enough business skills to see that it fits you or you're doing it yourself and you're paying yourself five grand a year, it's gonna cost you about 500 bucks to do it. So raise your hands if you wish there was an app for that, because I wish there was an app for that. <laughs> You're gonna love what we're gonna share later. Um, so. It's in the app, right? I just wanna make sure. Okay. So now we get into prepare. Oh, no, we don't. Oh, yes. So we get into prepare. So when you have a huge list, one of the things in preparation is you need to go and collect the swipe copy. So the swipe copy is the stuff that that joint venture partner gives you to send to your list. See, a joint venture done properly isn't, hey, let's go do stuff together. Okay, great. A really good joint venture, you're giving them the exact copy to send to their list that's likely to get someone to go to your funnel and likely to convert to a sale. Because nobody stays in a joint venture for long 
if they're not actually making sales of your stuff. So your swipe copy is important. You need to go and see what the people that are looking to have you sell their stuff offer to you. And you really, really need to update your LinkedIn and Facebook profiles. Um, a lot of times when we do a joint venture, we're gonna go check you out. Like we're not probably even gonna return your email, email until we check you out. So make sure that your LinkedIn and Facebook profiles are up to snuff and sort of says what you're doing and, and talks a little bit about what you're doing. So what is swipe copy? Again, in the case of your preparation, you're gonna need three to five emails to get the attention of your joint venture partner. Because remember, we're not talking about a simple affiliate program. We're talking about someone that exactly has something that the people you know could use. And you need to approach them to create this relationship. They don't have an affiliate program with you. Okay, so they're gonna to need to write this for you. Now, if you have products, there's a little bit more work. So interestingly enough, if you're the one wanting to get joint ventures to sell your stuff, you have a lot more preparation to do. Because now you need to create a product or service package. And a lot of times a successful joint venture is gonna be by you taking what you sell and turning it into a little bit more exciting package, usually with a little bit higher dollar value. If you sell $52 widgets, it's not likely many people are gonna want a joint venture with you. It's just not worth their while to make $10 every time they sell something. So packaging stuff together, product and service offerings is usually a very good way to go. You're gonna to need to write your swipe copy, right? So you're gonna to need to write the stuff that engages, that you've tested and you know works to get people to buy your stuff. And then you're gonna to need to give that to them to send to their list. You're gonna to have to be able to track because you're gonna to have to know who they are so that if a sale comes from somebody that's in your joint venture, you know that it came from them so you can pay them their appropriate commission. Uh, LinkedIn and Facebook profile update, same thing, you need to do it. So what is swipe copy? Well, in this case, it's three to five emails to get the attention of a potential joint venture partner, and it's another three to five emails that you give to your partners to send to their list to sell your stuff. This is the number one most important part, and this is the number one part that most people don't do. And why is that? Because it's hard. It's actually not that hard, and in fact, soon, we're gonna reveal a secret. So. Uh, your sales funnel with tracking is a place for your joint ventures to send their customers to buy or take action. The sales funnel online collecting of sale isn't actually 100% critical to a joint venture. You can do it just by tracking and phone calls. It depends how big your item is and how many customers you're expecting to get. Obviously, if you're only going to get 10 customers a month, you don't really need to do it online. But if you can potentially get hundreds of customers a month or you need to sift through them to qualify them, then a sales funnel is a very, very important part. Uh, and of course, tracking. You need to know who sent you the lead so you can pay the right person. And of course, if you want to do both sides, because you have a list and products, then you have to do a whole bunch more work because you have to do both sides of the equation. So, if you were to sub this out because you're lazy like me, what do you think it would cost to have all this done? Well, this is a bit scary when you break it down. So copywriting of 10 emails, you can find anywhere from $50 an email to $1,000 an email, depending on the type of email you're doing. Sales copy tends to run around $300 an email. You're going to need 10 of them, so that's $3,000. Your sales funnel tracking software, that's easy. You can do Infusionsoft or all kinds of different softwares. They're usually about 100 bucks a month, so that's not that big of a deal. Your sales funnel content creation, again, anywhere from $5,000 to $30,000 is often what it costs to do a proper sales funnel. And professional uh, mentors. So if you want to stay on track, one of the easiest ways to get on track that I found was get a mentor who knows how to do it that's going to spend an hour a month to make sure you're on track, hold you accountable, right? So instead of you not doing what you said you would do, you do it because you know you have that call with the mentor in another two days. Uh, LinkedIn and Facebook profile graphics update. So if you want to sub that out, you go to Fiverr. Usually around $600, which costs about $300 profile. You get all your graphics done, you get your words fixed, maybe a video done. Um, so it can run you as much as $13,000 in your first year. So if you're going to do a joint venture selling $10 widgets and you're expecting 10 customers, you're probably not going to do a successful joint venture because you're not going to have the revenue to actually cover the cost of doing it and keeping up time. So now we're going to give you a freebie because who thinks writing swipe copy is hard? Raise your hand if you think writing swipe copy is hard. Well, it is hard. It's really hard. <laughs> Just coming up with a headline is hard. So I learned a trick and I think everyone needs to know this trick and this isn't really easy to see, but um, Anybody in the room get a few emails from us talking about this event over the last week? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> right? Um, and if you hate them, I'm going to give you a reason now to shake my hand and say thank you very much as you walk out the door. Because what you should be doing is you should be on Facebook and getting signed up to everything for free. You should be going to Anthony Robbins and finding a way to go to 
his list. Brian Tracy, get on his list. See, because if you get on Brian Tracy and Anthony Robbins and all of the big people, you know, Craig and I, because we use this technique to teach you, so our stuff is using the same technique. What you end up with is you end up with a curated list of high converting headlines and high converting copy. So when you know that you want to try to sell a coaching program for $5,000, predominantly for women, you can go look at all of your experts that have taught you exactly how to sell that. You then take their headlines, you take their copy, you fit them to you, and you now have swipe copy that'll probably convert 50 times better than what you would come up with on your own. Swipe copy is an art. Selling by emails is an art. Headline writing is an art. So, uh, quick look at what we do for our swipe copy. Um, we have an email that we send out that starts with the subject, joint venture profits in five steps. It took Craig and I sitting together 15 minutes to come up with this headline. There's a couple of tools. If you're interested, send me an email. It's, my email's gonna be there later. I will send you a couple of tools that will actually help you think of headlines based on a few keywords, and then actually test you to show you what likelihood of your things being good. So you'll, you'll type something you think it's awesome, it'll like get 12%. You'll type in something, you go, I never opened that, and it'd be like 82%. And then you actually send an email with both, and the 82% one wins, and you go, oh. So a lot of the times what happens when you're doing swipe copy and you're building joint ventures is a lot of the stuff that you have to do is gonna be uncomfortable to you. Because what we always forget is we tend to wanna to sell to ourselves. And when you're doing a joint venture, you need to help your joint venture partner sell to their people, and their people are probably not like you. So that's all it is. You're just trying to make sure you learn the words of the people who want to buy your stuff instead of your words, which are the people selling the stuff. We get into lingo all the time, right? We get into all of those acronyms and stuff. And if you want a real estate agent, the words like, I'm not a real estate agent. I'm a real, I'm a real estate broker. Like, okay. so what's the difference? I don't care. I just want someone who can effectively sell my house, right? So we get in and we start with, uh, you know, dear C first name. So in this case, this is a macro. This is actually grab the first name from the database and send it out. So it's all personalized and customized. I've recently become aware of a program that may help your business increase sales because now this is your people's list, right? Did you know a joint venture done properly can raise your sales faster than almost anything else you can put your money or effort into? Right? It just starts with leading them to, hey, that's cool. And then when they want to learn more, we actually talked a little bit about how the swipe copy and everything could cost them $13,900. And then we teach them how they can actually save $10,000 by doing it themselves, okay? So it's just about getting engagement. They want to buy the product because it's gonna help them. Of course, then you get attention. So that's what swipe copy for. We actually then push them to a very simple uh, funnel. So we say right at the top of our funnel, we offer 20 or 35%, 20% cash, 35% credit to purchase things from us. Um, we talk about when we process the payments. And then we talk about all the available products and services that we have that they can resell. And this is all in a funnel. And at the bottom, we just simply take their information. So now we know that they want to be a joint venture partner. Then we reach out to see if there's a good fit and we approve them or not. So uh, step four, engage. Uh -huh. So you now need to reach out to five of the 10 you found and actually get a hold of them, have a conversation, whatever, have a Facebook messenger chat, get to know them and see if there's a good fit. Just because it looks like it's right, they may be really, really hard to deal with or they may have no swipe copy or they may just not fit after all on a, on a mind level. So you need to get out and actually go and talk to these people to see if they will actually engage with you in a joint venture. And then of course that leads to step five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, all the way to 99, which is follow up. You need to follow up and get the commitment. Once you have the commitment, if you've committed, keep your commitment. Never leave the meeting without tying it down. So if they've said, hey, well, I'll try to get that to you sometime next week, well, will that be Thursday or Friday? Tie it down, it's amazing. When someone says sometime next week, you know that it's not coming next week. Someone says Thursday or Friday, it's probably not coming till the end of Friday. Tie it down, because that'd be before noon or afternoon, right? As soon as it's tied down, it becomes firmer in their mind as something to do, so tie it down. Um, again, make it keep commitments on time. So let's summarize the setup costs. So we had the $500 of copywriting, we had all that other ugly muck. So to do a proper joint venture could cost you $13,900 if you sub it out. <laughs> That's probably the reason most people don't sub it out. So raise your hand if you have software templates and a team to help you set up your JV. Mm. Yeah, I tried that. Um, yeah, up work and you can assemble your professional. But anyways, yeah, I agree. It's right. awesome. I have some great news now. You can actually do almost all of it yourself. Uh, it just takes your time. So the one thing that you're really going to need is your sales tracking software, your sales funnel and tracking software. 
That's the real one thing that without it, you're, you're probably not going to make it. Swipe copy, you can learn to do yourself. Uh, all of that, you can learn to do yourself. Now, for those of you that, that do like the idea of doing it yourself, we do have a very special offer for you tonight. And that offer is that we are offering small business stream sales and marketing automation software with our business finder directory listing and our brand new module that just went live today, joint venture module. Imagine that. So what's included? Small business stream sales and marketing automation software has your email autoresponders, it has your sales funnels, it has your push notifications to your customers, your surveys, your business card scanner, your contact manager, and your social media follow-up. So this is actually your full sales and marketing automation suite, but maybe your joint venture. And then we add to that the business finder directory listing. So we actually have an app. Most of you who signed in, signed in through that app. You can find businesses close by that offer discounts and deals. Your business could be in there inviting customers to you. And the joint venture module, where in the latest version of the app, you'll actually see a little JV in some of the listings. Click the JV and you actually have the ability to request to joint venture with that person. So if you have our software, you can put your JV into our listing and everyone in the room instantly knows what everyone else is offering and can decide to joint venture with each other. So what's in the JV module? Well, as you've seen, you log in, you see the BBN uh, page. You're going to click back to look at the listing. And then you're going to look through the listing until you find something that has a joint venture offered. So in this case, we scroll until we find Lissandra. And we take a look at what the joint venture offers is. So they have a skincare product, and you click the joint venture, and it will tell you that they offer 10%. And then you can request to join their joint venture. Once you've done that, they get a notification. They decide if you're approved or not, because it's not an instant thing. It's not an affiliate program. It's meant to be a lot better. Uh, request to join, uh, confirmation, accepting the terms and conditions, and that's it you would have actually formed a potential joint venture. So you've actually done the prepare work, just this scrolling through to see that you have just done. So the regular price for this uh, app is actually $999 for a year. We're not looking for that today. We actually have a $249 offer today for one year. Um, so if you raised your hand and didn't want to do it yourself, <laughs> we actually have a better offer where we're actually uh, we have a done-for-you solution where I actually help you create a lot of the stuff. So you do get the same Small Business Dream software, the same joint venture module, the same business listing. You get the swipe copy. We're going to work with you to create your swipe copy. You're going to get your Facebook and LinkedIn profiles updated. We'll do graphics. We'll help you work on any words that might be getting in the way. Uh, it's a collaborative thing. We don't say do this, do that. We say, what are you trying to do? And we just help you get there a little bit more efficiently. Um, there's one year mentoring, so there's 12 one hour calls, so we help to keep you on track. These are personal calls. It'll either be with Craig or myself, and we'll go through where you're at, how things are going, and why you didn't bring it home. Nah, because you're all going to be home. Um, and the exclusive joint venture marketing uh, mentoring Facebook group. So we actually have a Facebook group where everyone who's in our joint venture program goes into. Everyone can ask each other questions. Obviously, you can say, hey, man, like, where are you in the app? I'd like to joint venture with you. But more importantly, you can say, hey, what does someone think of this as a headline? hey, would this work for your people? So it's a very, very powerful tool. It's almost like idea parties 24-7. So the regular price for this is $4,999 for one year. And today, because we're new with this app, uh, with the joint venture module, we're offering the whole thing for $2,499 for a year. Or if you wanted to pay monthly, it's $249 a month. That's all I have for the camera. I now need Roger. <laughs> uh, my name is Dennis Wilson. Uh, anybody online who is interested in any of the offers, please just send an email to Dennis at Small Business Dream. Let me know what you're interested to in, and uh, we will get in contact and work that out with you. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. It goes together, and we have to thank you, John. Yes. And we have to thank Ion Connect. And connect. Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Cool. you didn't put that there. <laughs> oh, oops. Go fast. Then come back. All right, go fast and then come back. Go, 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 go,
little finger is just working itself. Oh, bone. <laughs> <laughs> Ion Connect, thank you for making this reproduction possible. Thank you.